Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for gathering here. So, um, I don't know if you remember, but uh, I did a similar presentation, uh, well, a precursor to this presentation at last summit. I don't know, uh, were any of you present when I did our enterprise ready to the enterprise to the open stack transformation? Mm. Couple hands. Okay, so about me, um, I currently work at Innovance and Innovance being bought by Red Hat, I work at Red Hat and actually I have two roles at the moment. I'm at the same time VP products at Innovance and I'm director of product uh, management at, uh, for OpenStack at Red Hat. Um, I've been working on OpenStack since uh, the very beginning. Uh, I started uh, the Silometer project a while back. I've been traveling uh, the world a few times uh, doing OpenStack. And uh, you can reach me on RSC and on Twitter at Nijaba. If you're wondering what Nijaba means, it's uh, the first two letters from my first name, middle name, and last name. So, a year ago, uh, six months ago actually, times go very fast in OpenStack, I presented uh, a talk, are enterprise ready for the OpenStack transformation? And this slide is the conclusion which uh, I drew. Uh, as a reminder, I think that OpenStack is not a product. I think OpenStack is an engine which can be made to become any product that you want. Uh, so that means that this engine will never be enterprise ready by itself. However, given that we are not going to be transforming to OpenStack because we want to save on money just for that, that doesn't make sense there might be a, a good reason to be transforming to OpenStack, which is transforming the way your enterprise actually delivers services. And today, I want to follow up on this presentation by showing a sample roadmap of a project that goes toward that transformation. So, transformation. What is it about? We actually, when we are going toward the cloud project, very often the goal is to become more DevOps. And because there, are as, there is as many definition of the word DevOps as there are people, let me give you mine. <laughs> so I think that DevOps is something that has two dimensions, and that's why it is so difficult to define very simply. There is obviously a first dimension, which is a dimension of automation, where you want to go from standardization to automation in order to do continuous improvement of what you're delivering. And there is a second dimension, which is the way your people, your processes, and your technology are going to be interacting together. So it's not a s that simple a problem. You have to be watching for these two dimensions at the same time. To give you a little bit more background, in terms of standardization, we have to be standardizing on technology and standardizing the processes. So that means that if you want to be in a DevOps model, you will first need to make sure everybody that is going to be engaged into uh, this DevOps model agrees on these standards. And that touches about everything that is going to be the basis on the way you're going to be delivering these projects. There is automation, and automation may occur at all or any of these levels. Today, I'm going to be focusing on the automation of the infrastructure, since we're going to be talking about OpenStack. But you may want to be going up the stack, 
once you're done with the automation of the infrastructure. You may want to be automating the platform. You may want to be automating the application lifecycle. In terms of how you make this happen, how you're going to be uh, making sure that everybody is working uh, correctly, one thing that we found out is that the agility is a key element in the process. And here, don't take this loop here as things that happen in sequence. You don't need to go from A to B to C. You need to do all of this all the time. So in order for your project to become better and better over time, you need to be iteratively improving it by making sure that you're learning from the previous mistake. And one of the things that is very important in agility is to give the right for people to make mistakes on the basis that you're going to be catching these mistakes very quickly and fix them and improve from them. When we're talking about transforming the people, transforming the people might be one of the hardest things because you're going to have to transform the way that people think. And in order to do that, you cannot do that against their will. People have a natural resistance to changes. And transforming those people is going to be involving showing examples, demonstrating uh, effectiveness, training the people, a lot of things that you need to build into your project for it to be successful. When we're talking about the processes, well, it's very important that you always skip uh, on focusing on what is going to be the desired end result and how you're going to be measuring this uh, success. If you don't have measurability, it's very hard to ensure success. And regarding the technology, well, the automation is clearly the key, as we were saying uh, before. And here, we're going to be focusing on automation through OpenStack and automation of OpenStack. You don't want that, the, to put together a platform that is going to be allowing you to automate the deployment of your application without fully automating the deployment and the upgrade and the handling of the full life cycle of the platform using the exact same principle. In order to go faster, automation is the key. If you have people processes uh, in between key element of your flow, your flow is going to get constrained and you won't be able to go any faster. Now that this introduction is done, let's go into the, the real meat of this presentation which is a, a, a sample roadmap, something that is very similar to, actual, uh, to ac actually a customer use case uh, that we've dealt with, on how we've, we think it's best to go when you want to do this transformation when you're doing an open stack project. So in this case, we have a customer that has a few problems. His problems are that his IT has been externalized. They're, it's actually, they are working in a separate sub-entity of their group. So that means that all the BUs that uh, this customer is interactive with do not have a strong requirement to be working with him. They have the right to go elsewhere. And elsewhere means that very often, the IT department customers are going to AWS and are going to external competitors. And so that's causing an issue for this customer because he's afraid that his very job is going to disappear in the near future. Another problem is that the management of the whole entity 
he's still asking him to make sure that compliance is still in place. They don't want to see user data being stored outside of the authorized area for, uh, for this. They don't want to see uh, deployment of financial tools uh, that would not comply with the specific norms that are applicable to where the, the, the deployment is occurring, PCI DSS, for example. Their conclusion is that they need to be offering something that is similar or better than what their competitors are offering. So they decide to go toward building their own cloud environment. But the main question they come to us with is how? How do we go uh, at it? So at Innovance, we've de um, developed a methodology which starts every project with a two-day workshop. And when I say workshop, I mean a session where we work on making an assessment together with a customer. It's not Innovance presenting to a customer how to do things. It's Innovance and the customer teaming up to try to find the best solution to the problem that are being brought to us. The key element in this workshop is that the customer should come prepared with a list of use cases. This list of use cases are, is the list of things that needs to be accomplished by what we are going to deploy for, uh, for him and with him at the end of the day. From this list, we develop a common understanding of what the project is about. And we have the first element of what will later on constitute our backlog. We also think that another key component for this workshop to happen correctly is that all of the key stakeholders for the project are present in the same room. And that's for a very simple reason. It's because people within the same organization often never had the time to really discuss the use cases. And when we are, once we start discussing the use cases, very often disagreements occur. And we, if we have all these people, we can identify the disagreement and hopefully find a suitable middle ground. If we are missing one person in this room, the agreement or disagreement will never occur. Another key element, oh, this slide is ugly. Uh, another key element uh, in, this is, in this workshop is to be assessing the maturity of the customer. You don't go from zero to DevOps uh, the same way depending on where you're from. And this uh, ugly slide behind me, I was trying to make it nice, but something happened in the middle. <laughs> Um, describe the different levels of maturity that we've seen to, uh, in organization trying to go toward DevOps. It's not a rating system. And in fact, you can have people that have a mix of these different cases. But it's very important to understand where someone is before you start uh, doing a project. So. Once we've got this common understanding of where we are at, what we want to accomplish, then the use cases and the way to solve the use cases start to take shape. And the very next thing is to find a way to time the project, to define a roadmap, to cut the project in simpler steps that will be manageable within a reasonable amount of time. And from our experience, a reasonable amount of time should never be more than three months between the start of a milestone and its end. Because if you go over three months, things seem to be very far away for everyone, and things start to lag. For this particular use case, uh, for this particular uh, user, uh, uh, story, we had a customer that presented us 
a series of uh, use cases that fell very easily into three different types of populations that he was trying to address. The first population that was identified was a population of administrators, the people that are going to be maintaining the cloud. The second one was a population of developers, the people that were going to build application on top of this cloud. And the third one was a population of end users. And this division was the thing that became obvious during the workshop that could be the different milestone, that could be uh, giving a real rhythm to the whole project. And that's how we ended up with a high-level roadmap where we identified the specific use cases that the customer wanted to cover that were matching X, Y, and Z population. Okay? So we defined three milestones as we would grow the cloud into giving more and more services to more and more people. In milestone one, the first thing we did was define uh, an overarching theme for the milestone. And for milestone one, standardization and commoditization were the first two keywords we wanted to work on. And in order for this to happen, for automation to occur, we needed to start with a so small platform that would be our ongoing testbed, the playground for admins, that we could redeploy automatically as much as we wanted, and on which we could automatically test if everything that we uh, were doing was working. So we created a CI, and we ensured that this platform was continuously deployed based on the changes that we would make in a standard environment. This had two goals in mind. First, ensure that we understand uh, what the uh, environment looked like, or at least the customer would, and define what the portal to access this cloud would be, and two, to start imagining what kind of SLA this administrator population would have to expose to the developer population because the, the, the customer of the admin population is clearly the developer population. In Milestone 2, the joining of forces of ops and dev was one of the first keyword. The other one uh, was focusing on the next population, which was the user. And to do this, we created a second platform that would be dedicated as the developer environment, where we would produce a first application as a, a test case, where we would develop the reporting and billing capacity, and which would in turn give us the tools that we needed to define what would be the, our standard templates which would help us define what would be the SLA that we would be using uh, for the users and define the user interface of the provisioning environment. Milestone 3 evidently was doing the first deployment of a third platform that would be the user targeted platform, the real production environment. And this was the most ambitious part because we would deploy this same environment in three data centers around the world so that the environment would always be as close as possible to the user population. We wanted to add the ability from the uh, graphical user interface for people to be asked a few questions that would allow them to have a smart deployment of the application where it needed to be. For example, if I have an application that is aimed at uh, selling things 
to people in Asia, it would make more sense to have this application deployed in an Asian data center. But you can add many more rules based on compliance, based on what you know of the data center security. And if uh, you do that correctly, then you do not need to have any more uh, people interaction uh, when you want to deploy a new application. This platform would be the one that would be in production and would be where all the workloads would be deployed in the end. And in this platform, on its first deployment during the, the first milestone, we would be able to validate the SLA cascading that we had defined previously. And of course, that would be the trigger to define what would be the next application we would do. So in the end of the, at the end of the workshop, we came up with this high-level design, which is more a design of how we were going to produce the environment than a design of how the environment would be structured. Well, we did actually during the workshop also provide a high-level design of the deployment, but that's a little bit less interesting than this idea that we would have a single environment that would be consuming various upstream, combining them with the local modification we needed to make, configuration, uh, additional UI, etc., all stored in a central Git repository that would be the feeding point for a continuous integration platform, which would have the standard test that OpenStack provide, combined with the customer-specific test that we would continuously validate on the test or admin platform. And once we felt comfortable that the modifications that had been made are working correctly on the test or admin platform, we would then allow the automated redeployment of the development environment, where the devs could then validate manually that their application are still working. Or, if they're smart, they could add the test into the continuous integration platform to make sure from the source that we would never break their application. And as a follow-up, once the devs are satisfied, then we could automatically redeploy the changes into the production platform. So using Red Hat uh, tools based, uh, around OpenStack, we've got up a about all the tools that we need to do this uh, continuous delivery of the cloud. It's a combination of multiple components um, which go from the tool that will be used by the product manager to the tool that are used by the operations people. We absolutely need to have this full range of tools to do the automation because this is the real uh, goal of this project, transform the way we deliver IT to people. But the tools need to be combined with agility, as we said before. And in terms of agility, at Innovance, we've been advocating the use of Scrum uh, into the project that is targeted at deploying a cloud, the same way you would use Scrum when you're developing an application. And that means that you need to define your product owner. And in our best practice, the product owner is always somebody from the customer population. It cannot be someone from Innovance because clearly Innovance doesn't know very well what the customer wants. The, so the product owner is always a customer person. A scrum master and team members, this should be a combination of people from the customer environment and from us so that along the project we could transfer our skills to the end customer because the goal here is not for us to create long-term ties with the customer, it's to en uh, empower the, cu the customer to continue at the end without us. And by using short sprints of two weeks that would produce small increments over uh, a three-month cycle, 
we would ensure that we had results delivered and measurable and verifiable by the product owner at the end of this uh, short cycle. We would englobe the notion of sprint within another cycle, which is the, the, the milestone, which has a three month duration, which would be the exact right time at which to revalidate with the business owner of what we're doing, that we're going towards the, same, the, the right direction, that what we've delivered matched his expectation. And sometimes the market changes around the project, so you may want to course correct what you've been doing. And of course, this happened. But another thing that I didn't tell you is that across the project, we've been doing a little trick. I told you about the product owner that should always be the customer. But if you remember correctly, when I talked about the population, I was saying that the customer of the IT team was the dev population, that the customer of the dev team was the end user population. So we decided from the get-go with the customer to use a product owner that would be someone from the developer population. And as we move forward in our milestones, we change the product owner to be someone from the end user population. Another thing that was quite important was this, uh, what we call the contamination uh, principle. As we want this new process to be adopted across the enterprise, we decided with uh, the customer that we wanted to demonstrate an example of something simple that was the, the test environment. And as we demonstrated that, we thought that we would have a lot more ease at finding people that would like to join this new process. So basically, you take a small group of people that are sharing the same idea that you have. You always find uh, a few people that share the same idea, the, the people that want to change stuff. There is always a, a little group that wants to do that. And you use them as an example to attract others in the second phase. And as you move forward, you split the teams. So that means that once you reach a maximum number of people within a team, which we set arbitrarily at 10, as we think it's a pretty good number to start splitting the, the teams, you add new people to a team where you already have people that knows the process, that knows how to work with the environment. And so the, the cross-training happened very naturally in that case. And through this uh, cross-training mechanism, you very quickly have a population of uh, users, developers, and uh, admins that becomes very familiar and got to your new way of de uh, developing application, developing environment that is as close as possible to what we targeted as a DevOps model. Does this make sense? So, in the end, we had a customer that had a bunch of problems, which I uh, described earlier, for which we offered an internal infrastructure as a service, and later on, uh, even a platform as a service, for which we built the three environment with self-service portals, for which we organized the work in small team dedicated on delivering s consumable items, bite size, with a scrum methodology and with uh, a use of agility as the mean to organize the uh, work process. The result we got from that was, well, first of all, we used the cloud deployment as the opportunity to grow to DevOps. 
Second, we clearly saw a reduction in time to market for an application to be, uh, to be developed and deployed. We were able to have the customer regain control on where the application were being uh, deployed. And therefore, they were able, from the fact that these applications were now running on their infrastructure, to produce the reports that they were asked to produce on a very regular basis. It's also uh, the way that suddenly what each group was doing became really clear to the other groups. Once you start having your product owner, that is not anymore somebody from your own team, but it's somebody from the team you're delivering to, it's very easy to understand what you're trying to achieve. A lot more than in the previous model that this organization was using. And in the end, this IT organization became, again, the IT organization of the more global environment. It became not anymore a cost center, but a, a place where people would go to generate profit. And this change in mindset is really key because that ensure that the perception of what you're doing is now shared across the organization. And as a mirror to that, they also became a lot more business focused, focusing on solving the issues that the business had instead of focusing their, what they thought were the internal problems that they should be solving. Any questions? Yes. So Nick, one of the um, key success factors when you do something like Scrum or Agile maybe it's more generally um, is actually get Can you can you speak in the microphone because sure. this is being taped and um, Does this work? Yes. Yeah. So one of the key success factors I've seen when you use Scrum or Agile in general is to actually get that feedback after each cycle so you get actionable feedback that you can base improvements on. Is, is that a challenge that you have seen? It's not a challenge. It's actually the, the, the whole point of it. Uh, well, but get, getting it can be difficult if you don't have customers that are willing to invest the time and effort. So, yeah, so that's a, a very good point. Getting this PO from the, 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 the customer population is a hard thing to get. And this is why f we need to identify that from the workshop, from the very early beginning of the project. We need to have the business owner of the, the project to uh, make sure that they have people in their team that are going to be willing to be playing that role. And of course, identifying these people is going to be key to the, to the success because otherwise, as you said, you won't get the feedback that you need to improve. Yeah. Thanks. So this can be uh, an even bigger challenge if you are developing uh, an application which is outward focus, in which case your internal prod, uh, product owners or product managers need to be reviewing what you're doing with willing sample set of, uh, of customer. And that's a challenge in itself. Yeah, microphone, thanks. So when you, when you scale up, you have all these teams. Uh, how do you monitor them when it comes to their willingness willingly, uh, to change? Because I think this is a, is a big issue, because when you scale up, you, you don't have an individual contact anymore, but you have team contact. Uh, how do you keep them with the mindset, or how do you get them with the mindset? So this contamination principle that I was trying to uh, explain in uh, the little graph here is based on the idea that once you've convinced someone, you'll be able to convince someone else. So once you've convinced a team that... No, that's not the right line. I went one too far. When you convince a team that this is the right way to work, when you make it grow, the additional people that are going to complete the team are going to be 
to be convinced by the one that were already there on the well-being of that, uh, yes, of that process. How do you monitor when you're in the next phase in the M3, M4? How do you do things like that? Because you, you it's based on that the, the one person that's going into the next team. Oh, how do you monitor the, you the, the whether that's happening uh, okay or not? Well, you have um, measurable indicators, which is the velocity of the team, whether they, they deliver uh, new features on a regular pace or not. And you've also got the, the people feedback uh, that is collected both by the Scrum Master and the product owner. Okay. Kurt, you had another question. <laughs> I did. Um, what other challenges or resistance did you find in this transformation process? So uh, the, the the challenges that we uh, that we see is to get the commitment from the stakeholders. Um, it generally happens, but on about 20 workshops that we've seen so far, we've got two cases where the customer was not really w uh, completely willing to play the game. And the good thing is that that shows up directly at the workshop. Uh, unfortunately, at that time, that, that the, first, the, the, the first guy that ever did resist to this methodology was one of th our very early customers. And we didn't have yet the gut to tell this guy, okay, we don't, we're not willing to work with you, this is not going to work. So we accepted the thing, and um, yeah, uh, we spent quite a bit of time of uh, uh, under-delivering uh, something that finally worked, but not as well as we, we, we would have liked. Um, a, a second uh, problem that we see is when we identify the wrong people to be the, the, the first core team of the thing. Um, and this is something on which we don't know yet how to measure. We, we have to rely on a manager to be pointing to the right people. But if we end up with the wrong core team, we'll never have the advocates to go advertise about this new methodology and give this uh, feel of, uh, oh, I want to be part of it too, to the others. Thanks. You're welcome. Any other questions? Yes. From your point of view, how uh, should the, the team, the developer team, manage their debates? For example, Nova Network versus Neutron, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Is it should it be via emails or uh, cooler discussions or? So. Uh, we generally like to have interactive uh, means of discussions. And it will depend on the uh, habits of the enterprise we are w working with. Some people have a very strong culture of doing video conferencing. Others have a very strong c culture of all being in the same room. Oh, did I mention that a workshop cannot work if not everybody is in the same room? Just because of the tool that we are using to do the workshop? Require to have uh, whiteboards and uh, sticky notes and stuff like that. But once we move into the project, the, the team can be fully distributed or not, depending on the, cu the, the customer culture. And we certainly do not want to be fighting too many wars at once. If we want to go toward DevOps, we're not going to go toward uh, pushing an enterprise to go toward distribution at the same time. We may want to do that later on, but yeah, let's do one thing well at once. So. Um, uh, generally, the, the, the team meeting are occurring either uh, video conferencing in the same room or even RSE. We've seen uh, groups of uh, people that uh, are really used to do RSE or any chat mechanism to do their, uh, their daily meetings, and that works very well. Now, sometimes you need to have a debate that goes beyond a single uh, Agile team. And how do you bring that to, to fruition? So it really depends. Um, generally, we start the debate via email or any other means like this. But as soon as we sense that it's very hard to get a consensus, we call that to a stop. And 
we bring them into another uh, one of these workshops. And the, the, the workshop is a great tool to align people because very often disagreement come from a different perspective on the same problem. I want to solve three use cases that may not be the three same use cases that the other guy wants to solve. And therefore, we are arguing that, oh yes, we should be using Neutron or we should be using Nova Network uh, while we don't have the same understanding of the problem at, uh, to start with. Any other question? Okay, so now some room for advertisement. Did you know that you can get, as a limited offer, a free certification exam from Red Hat? So come see us on our booth. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>